how we're going to get going today. But sometimes these, record, these recordings, there are a lot of people who don't do lecture recordings, right? Do all your classes do lecture recordings? No, there are a lot of people who don't. And universities just won't allow lecture recordings because they consider their, their lectures their private property. I think I work for you. And anything resource I can give you, I want to. But this is technology that sometimes isn't great. I had a class yesterday that the recording didn't come up. It's still hidden in here somewhere, whatever that means. I don't know technology on science. A scientist, essentially, right? But anyway, we're trying to find that lecture and get it up. Even the IT people can't do it. But I'm trying to get this for you, and, and I try to give you that resource. More work on my part, but I don't care. I want you to have it, right, as a resource. But if you're not liking it, if you don't can't, if you don't like it, then that's fine. You need to do something else, and that's that's smart to do that. So you can buy little recorders, and those little recorders, I think they're ten dollars. Somebody told me at Walmart or wherever you need to get them. You can put them right up here on the desk at the beginning of class. Don't disturb people. Do it well before class starts, and start it, and they come up after class and turn it off and leave with it, right? And do your own, and that's fine. Before we were able to do lecture recording through our systems, I've been lecture recording for a decade, but before we were able to do that, that's all people had. And they would say, God, this. and I was like, yeah, you would want to listen to it again, bless your heart. But yeah. Um, and so it would look like little mice up here at the table with so many people my recordings, but that's up to you. And I can't guarantee you that every time technology is going to work. I just can't do it, right? But I'm going to try my best to get these lecture recordings to you by the late afternoon. I'll have your grades up by late this afternoon uh, because feedback is everything in education, rapid feedback. And I will have those grades up and hopefully the lecture recordings posted and um, your little areas for, for study guides. Any questions for me before we get going? No? All right. All right, so I have no idea where we stop because that's just me. But anyway, I, I think it's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll find out. Uh, we covered a lot of stuff, didn't we? I do need for you to know that even if I didn't ask a question about something that I covered the other day, it still is fair because it's in your notes for the test. Everything we talk about is fair for those multiple choice tests that come your way, right? The first test will be chapters one through four, right? So, I say right. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. So good. Just so you know, uh, it just you don't want to just study your quizzes. You continue to review your notes. You review them as much as you need to to make sure that you really own it. Um, you know, as far as medical anthropology goes, and and the way that we understand why we're where we are today, as far as med where we or in this minute of time as medicine. There's been a crazy amount of stuff that's been done to get us to where we are. But, um, you know, and just crazy, really unethical things that have done to, to get us where we are. Um, I'm not going to ask you any questions about anthropology and it, just the history of this. But the fact is, um, you know, still some things are going on that are a little bit questionable. So do you think in medicine we really need to keep our thumb on ethics and talk about the ethical repercussions of what we're doing to find out information about not only health but disease. I, I think so, right? Because like back in the gladiator ages, they would cut people open that were alive just to see how things were working inside of them. Do you think they had anesthesia? It, it was such a horrific practice that was going on so much that they, they had to, the government had to make a law that that's, not, that's illegal, stop doing that, right? You wouldn't think you'd have to tell somebody that, but that's really true. And another example, just for your information, that happened not very long ago. Um, Y'all, does anybody know what Hansen's disease is? Does anybody know what Hansen's disease is? And this is something maybe you do want to know. Go ahead and write this one down. Hansen's disease. What is, because it's just giving you an idea about ethics and how, and this is fairly recent, and how we have to be careful about understanding ethical repercussions of things that we're doing with patients and to patients, okay? Hansen's disease is actually what is now um, the disease that you all have, have heard of. It's not called it anymore. It's called Hansen's disease. It's leprosy. Have you ever heard of leprosy? 
Most of you've heard of leprosy, haven't you? What kind of con connotations do you have with the disease leprosy? What do you think of when you think of leprosy? Uh, skin lesions. Well, they, it, okay, so thank you. As far as presentations, this is a disease that can affect the cutaneous areas of the skin, so noses will drop off, eyelids, eyebrows, lips, fingers, toes, hands. So, so yes, that's a cutaneous version of it, of leprosy. It's caused from a bacterium. Um, and it's actually a bacterium that we can treat. But what do you think of just emotionally when you hear the term leprosy? Maybe not if you have it. Does there, has everybody heard of leprosy? Who hasn't heard of leprosy? Oh, okie dokie then. I need to back up. All right, so let the Bible, right? Did you just say the Bible? <laughs> okay, all right. Hey, that's okay with me, but look, so, but I will tell you something. Um, Leprosy is used as a stigma to things. People will say, oh, well, they're a leper, or that, whatever. And where that came from was really our religious writings, not just the Bible, but the Torah and the Quran. There's, there's writing about lepers and how lepers had to be ostracized from society because they were the dirty, they were the unclean, they were the diseased, and they were quarantined away from society. So that, that name of that disease, but did people back in the day know what caused leprosy? No, they thought you were just God had smited you, whatever, Allah, God, who had smited you, and you needed to be taken away from, from good, clean society. So the word leprosy has really, um, to people who have been brought up with those writings, has a very negative, connotation right all right so anyway so why that's one of the, that's a good reason to change the name in it to, to Hansen but let me tell you why it's called Hansen's disease now Dr. Hansen was a doctor who had some patients who had leprosy and they had the very early mild forms of leprosy and he wanted to know more about the disease and he was a scientist as well as you know a medical practicing physician who was a scientist so you know what he decided to do to find out, to investigate. He took uh, samples, skin scraping samples from his infected patients and infected his healthy patients. So he had more patients to study. <laughs> but, but that's the face I was expecting. <laughs> that, that face of like, oh my God, did he really do that? Okay. Yes, he did. Were they willing volunteers? No. Oh like who would willingly volunteer to have leprosy, right? No, they did not know, they were unknown. And he did writings on it, right? And he became pretty famous, because guess what, baby? He found out a lot about leprosy. Because he had a lot of people who had it. <laughs> He'd actually infected them, though. Okay, so now, because he contributed so much to the knowledge, our knowledge of leprosy, leprosy is actually called Hansen's disease. And informed people now know that this is not a disease that came from a god, right? or because of the side of the railroad tracks you're born on, or the color of your skin or the, the positions you get in when you have sex. It's not that. It's from a bacteria. And actually, it's not even that easy to catch. It used to be thought that it was incredibly contagious, but it actually isn't that easily uh, easy to catch. So now, years ago, there used to be leper colonies. There is still one in the United States, but it's just voluntary. It's in Hawaii. It's a leper colony, and they want to stay there. They want to live there. They're in a very, you know, little niche area that is, uh, you know, they're happy to be there with other people who have to do. They don't have to stay there, though. They could go out to your Walmart, and they could, you know, they could swim in your pool, and they could do whatever, you know, because it's not that easy to catch. And we can also treat it. So we've, we've come a long way. But still things like that are going on, is what I want to tell you. And so the, if you look at the history of medicine and what people did, it's horrific. <laughs> what people did to other people. So we have come a long way, uh, but we still need to be very aware and conscious of medical ethics and uh, certainly need to have some governing bodies. You know, there's a reason for governments um, but to have some governing bodies as far as like what's going on in medicine. So, so a little bit out there, just for your interest, but I don't want you to know, just the only thing you need to know, Hansen's disease is equal to leprosy, a 
uh, disease that's caused from a bacterium, isn't it? And actually, if you want to know the name of the bacterium, I'll go ahead and give that to you because you should know it. It's Mycobacterium, Mycobacterium leprae is the species. So Mycobacterium is the genus, Mycobacterium, and the species is leprae. All right. Um, so anyway, that's just a little example of that. And I'm not going to ask you about any other health, any other uh, history kind of thing to this point. If you ever get to take a, a medical anthropology class, I would advise it because it's just so fascinating. Okay, so um, the cell theory. This is a scientific theory, and I want you to write that word down, that, that phrase down, a scientific theory, the cell theory. And I want you to know the two premises of the cell theory. Can I start the recording? Yeah, uh, I did, okay. I want you to know the two premises of the cell theory. Here's the first one, and this is a scientific theory. The first one says that the smallest unit we know that has properties of life is a cell. And actually, did I give that one to you, Monday? Yes. I did, didn't I? We'll do a lot of building like that when we hear things over and we repeat and build our foundation. The second thing that the cell theory says is that life comes from pre existing cellular life. That life comes from pre existing cellular life. What that means, Grayley, is that you have parents that were alive. And guess what they had? Parents. And guess what they had? Parents. <laughs> so that's what that means. It means that if you, um, you know, if you, if you see cows out in the field, pooping in the field, because that's what they do, flies don't just originate from the cow piles. They don't. Eggs were laid, and then, then flies come. Meat that you have in your smokehouse or have left out where you shouldn't have had it. The larvae that comes on the meat didn't just spring up, life didn't just spring up. It comes from pre-existing cellular life. The cell theory is a scientific theory, those two main premises, that has only been accepted by scientists for about 120 years now, about 120 years, around 1900. And I want you all to know that who finally gave us enough information to tip the hat on this was Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur, he is a scientist that uh, actually did a lot. He kept our wines from spoiling. <laughs> and that's a good thing. Gave us pasteurization, right? Y'all heard of pasteurization, haven't you? Guess who gave us that process? <laughs> Louis, that guy. Louis Pasteur did that. Louis Pasteur also did a, uh, an experiment or a series of experiments that finally made the scientific community in the world except that life only comes from pre-existing cellular life. Well, what the heck do people think that it came from in 1900? By the way, my grandmother, grandmother was out alive. My grandmother was born in like 1800. So it was uh, 1900 that long ago. It really wasn't in the scheme of things. It was not long ago. It was a blink of the eye. So anyway, it took 400 years of scientific methods being used in testing that we're leaning toward this cell theory. It took 400 years of testing before finally it was accepted as a scientific theory that life comes from pre-existing cellular life. Where did people think it came from before? It just could spring up. That life could spring up. You could build a barn, put clean, fresh hay in it today, and mice would be there tomorrow because they just sprung up. That you could right, that you could have, make this nice um, wine and it'd be spoiled next week. I can. Yes. <laughs> like it's not already. What did you just say? It's already well. It's fermented. That's not really. That's not going bad. Go. It go. It can go bad. It's certainly fermented to get the alcohol. But that's a process. So anyway. That people thought that life came spontaneously with the spring up. It was called the theory of spontaneous generation. The theory of spontaneous generation. And it was only in the 1900s when Louis Pasteur finally did his series of experiments that, that took really 400 years prior to him, people doing this, saying that's not what happens. Life does not come from non-life. Why did people hold on to that? 
that idea that it did for so long. Why do you think? Because what didn't explain my other family. Because of their prejudices they brought in with them. And where did their prejudices come from? You only know what you know, right? You don't know what you don't know. So you know what you know, and what you know is that you've been brought up on readings and teachings that tell you that life can just spring up. What were those readings and teachings? Religious readings and teachings. Now, I'm not telling you all that, that uh, don't go out of here and say, she told us we can't be religious. I don't care what you want. You can have any religion you want. There have been millions of religions since humans have come on this planet. There have been millions of gods that have been worshipped. So whatever your flavor of that is you want to believe in, I don't care. You believe in whatever you want to. But I'm telling you that that's why it was so hard for people to accept this, because they didn't feel good about it. They didn't feel confident about it. They didn't feel comfortable about it. But this is what we know. And it's a scientific theory now. That the cell theory in those two premises and Louis Pasteur. I'll talk more about this scientific theory. We really are living in a revolution. Things are happening so fast because we can see at an atomic level now. We can see at an atomic level. And where did I tell you we really need to understand before we can understand life as well as non life on this planet? We have to know it at an element level, right? At a chemistry level. And so much now that we can see, it's really, really happening. Um, so, uh, if I skip something, are you going to are you going to have to study it? Are you going to spend a lot of your time studying it if I don't talk about it? No. Okay, good. So here's what I want you to know in science, because I gave you all a definition for science the other day, didn't I? I said this is science is using me methods, methodical methods. That sounds redundant to actually go about setting up experiments to answer questions about the natural world. But it's limited to the natural world. It's limited. Scientists shouldn't think that they are able to do things about, it's not. It's limited to the natural world, science is. And so this is how we do it. Let me tell you how a methodical uh, test would actually, or, or experiment would actually run. There are five steps, and I want you to know them in order because they make sense in order. They don't make sense unless they're in order. And, I, and forget what you might have learned in some things. Because some people say um, there are different steps, but these are the real ones. You ready? The first step in a scientific inquiry is an observation. You make an observation. You observe something. And the second, the right observation. The second step is from that observation. You just wrote observation part of it. The second step is from the observation. It made you ask a question. You ask a question about that. You observe. Second step, you ask a question. Third step, ready? Third step is you answer the question. You answer it in the form of a statement. The fourth step is that you set up a test to test whether your statement was right or not. So you test. And the fifth final thing you do after the testing, you make a conclusion. So what you would have written is observation, question, maybe you wrote act, answer the question, but really what that statement is, does anybody know what that statement is actually called? It's called a hypothesis. So the third step's a hypothesis. The fourth was a test. And the fifth thing you wrote was conclusion, which really means whether you accept or reject your what? Hypothesis. You know what the beauty about science is? The beauty about science and being a scientist is that it's okay to be wrong in your hypothesis because are you learning as you go you know it was edison who actually had he before he he figured out which what could move electricity there were over two thousand different materials he tried that didn't work now you would have to think to yourself most people would have quit right 
but he didn't. And when he was asked, like, why did you keep going? Guess what he said? I learned over 200 things that won't transmit electricity. He was learning. So it's okay. This is what science is about, right? So when you know the five steps, let me tell you about these five steps. They're how logical people think on a daily basis that aren't scientists. A logical person. Can I have your name? Will. Mike? Will. Will? Okay. So Will. Will woke up this morning. He woke up, he looked at the alarm clock, made an observation. I'm making this up. I don't know if he has alarm. So, but he made an observation that his alarm didn't go off. Observation alarm. My alarm went off. He asked the question, why did my alarm go off? My significant other turned my alarm off. <laughs> what was that that he just stated? His what? How about can he test it? And he could test it. He could say, Did you turn my alarm off? I <laughs> can't And you know, so he could test it and then he could make a conclusion whether this hypothesis had been wrong or right. And did he learn? Okay. Look, so guys, this is a method. You've already used the scientific method a dozen or more times today. This is common sense, but this is the way scientists do too. But, you know, nobody really cares if Will is slow or, you know, it's long at all or whatever. I mean, not that he cares, but nobody really does. But in science, when we are really looking at like big questions, big questions about, wow, this plant was, it, well, oil from this plant actually help arthritis or cardiovascular disease or whatever. When somebody makes that observation and asks that question and then makes a hypothesis and tests it for conclusions, right? When they do that, a lot of times there's a lot right in that. So let me give you some examples of what needs to happen when a true scientific testing occurs. These are some things that must be in place for you to have faith why that needs to take the word faith and belief for you to have confidence in the conclusion. You ready? These are some things that have to happen. In science, when testing is done, you typically have to have a large sample size. A large sample size. Jasmine, if I said, hey, Jasmine, I think if you smoke this, this is going to help you. With this, earth. and and you know, Jasmine, if you smoke, you say, "Hey, I work." I can't put it out to the population because one person said that worked for them. You get what I'm saying? You have to have a large sample size, and you have to have a lot of different demographics in those samples. Do you get what I mean? And you have to have large numbers supporting that most of the people in your sample size really did have this effect, right? Because y'all aren't going to trust me if I say something worked when I only tested it on a few people, right? Because that is, that's needed. Let me tell you what else you have to have. You have to have blind and double blind studies. Let me tell you what blind studies mean. In your large sample size, nobody in the sample knows whether they're getting the actual, and I'm using medicine here for like pharmaceutical companies, but this isn't anything. They don't know if they're getting the drug or not. They're blind to that. Why do you think we need blind studies? To remove what? Placebo effect. Yes, the placebo, the psychosomatic effects. Listen, your mind is a powerful thing. And this is how antibiotics mostly work. They're not really needed. Guess what? You just feel better when you take them because your mind is that powerful. They're so overused. But it removes that. It tries to, or it tries to, can it completely? No, but it tries to. So what's a double blind study? I'm the pharmacy company, I'm the investigator, I've got my sample people, they don't know, they don't know which ones have the uh, drugs and which ones don't, but I don't either, because I've blinded it from myself. Why would you want a bl double blind study where the investigator doesn't even know who's got it? Because as an investigator, I might be thinking to myself, Fatima, is of this age, of this gender, I know it works better on this, I'm gonna give her the drug, and it's gonna look better on my results when I know that males might not be 
don't want to make the male to be my, you get what I'm saying? So you can't do that. Double line studies. Then you can have more confidence in those results. Let me, when you get to the conclusion, let me tell you what else. So why the double line studies, large samples? Let me tell you what else can make you feel more comfortable. You have repeated that testing exhaustively. You didn't use just one large sample size. You went to another state, uh, city and you did it again. You did it in three different hospital locations. You get what I'm saying? You did it exhaustively, that study. Hey, and that's not all you did. So it's not like you just repeated the study. You got someone else who didn't have a dog in that fight that wasn't going to make any money. Like, I was going to make money if this drug worked, right? But you, you have somebody who is just as much of an expert at conducting scientific experiments that aren't going to get any money. They're not going to get any fame, so they're not going to get written up in any ma magazine. They're not going to get anything from it, and they do it on the same large sample size with the same double line, and they got the same results. Are you with me? So peer review, peer review, and then statistical analysis that is thorough. Because sometimes guys do numbers speak, they speak, but sometimes they lie, okay? So you can make numbers look certain ways, but you've got to have uh, people outside that are looking at your numbers and making sure that, that your study actually said what it said it's going to do. So these are things that make the scientific method better. And so here's what I want to tell you about um, here's what I want to tell you about the scientific theory. But I, I, I'm always a little bit surprised that most students don't understand what a scientific theory is. Most students think like the theory of evolution, the cell theory, the sliding filament theory, all these theories that really are uh, simple theories. Some of these theories, they don't understand. That this, they think, oh, well, it's just somebody's idea of this. No, it isn't. That's, you use the term theory outside, like in a psychology, sociology. You use the term theory differently than a scientist would. That, that is like, well, I have a theory about why she's cheating on him. You know what I'm saying? You use that word theory differently. But a scientific theory is the most exalted explanation for a naturally occurring phenomenon that we know. It's, it is the most trusted explanation that we have to date. To date. Are you with me on this? The scientific theory means that if it's a scientific theory, it's a statement that explains a naturally occurring phenomenon. And it's the most trusted by the most experts that we have to date. It is using laws. It is using facts, scientific laws, scientific facts, and exhaustive research to come to that statement. That is a very different thing than saying a theory, you know, like a social theory of, of business or whatever. It's a very different kind of thing. Now, here's the thing about scientific science and scientific theories, and scientists have to own this, so listen to this carefully. I told you that in science, the limitation of science is only about the natural world. There's some things that we can't test. It's only about the natural world. It's not about beliefs, not testing beliefs that can't be tested. It's not about that. It's just the natural world. And here's another limitation, and that's that if new data comes in that supports a different explanation in a way that is going to override the other, then scientists have to let that go. Do you get what I mean? Do you, are you hearing me? So in, a true, in true science, this is how science is carried out. Are you with me on this? I do want you all to understand all that. All right, now, so we have um, theories. The theory of evolution. What does the theory of evolution say? And I want you to know that Charles Darwin is given credit for that. Charles Darwin is given credit for the theory of evolution by natural selection. What does it say? What does it say? That we evolved. That else to help us survive. We evolved, and, and we evolved to, from what you said? From, I, I didn't know. Oh, I didn't say what we evolved. You're on this, like, you have this deep, this is a deep voice. And I think I'm like, I have to like really listen. But, um, 
So we did evolve, and it does have about what is what's the word evolve mean? Change. To change. All right. So let me say this to you. Uh, what, do, what do some of you think the theory of evolution say? Come on, y'all talk to me. Come on. We change based on our environment, species. Do individuals evolve? No. That's in your little social science classes. I'm not saying you can't evolve, Jasmine. We can all change how we think. God, let's hope we do. You know, so look, because that means growth, right? So we, we all do that. But that's not where the theory of evolution is talking about. It has nothing to do with individuals. That's a myth in the theory of evolution. Does the theory of evolution say that man came from monkeys? No. No, that's a big myth. That's what's taught. It is propaganda. And why people don't want the theory of evolution taught. You know that there's scientific theories now that are, have been accepted for decades that can't be taught in schools in this country. That's scary to me. <laughs> that's really that's really scary. That's ignorance at its highest level. And when I say ignorance, I mean lack of education at its highest level. Because it means those people are afraid of science and don't understand science the biggest myth about evolution says that man came from monkeys hey guys if man came from monkeys we'd still be coming from monkeys why would it have stopped that is a myth that is propaganda that is not accurate the theory of evolution simply states this and if you have to write down what i say verbatim to get it and that's fine before you start writing that let me tell you it's not about individuals changing. It's about an entire species percent of, pop, of traits within the species changing over time. The theory of evolution explains to us that the trait, and listen to this, the percentage of traits found within a population of a species will change over time. That's all it says. There's nothing scary about it. There's nothing, there's nothing scary about that. It says the percentage of traits found within a species will change over time. Did everybody write that down? Because that's a, that's all it says. <laughs> right? Okay, so let me let me say this to you. And I don't care, I don't care because it's not about believing. A scientific theory. It's about learning about scientific theories. I don't care what you believe, but you need to learn what the scientific theories are that are accepted today by the best science today. And then, honest to goodness, if next week or tomorrow something else comes out and more testing is done, we find out something new, we have to accept it and throw the old out. But this isn't about beliefs, this is learning. Okay? So let me give you an example. How many of you have been to J Jamestown? How many of you have been on those little boats, those little replicas of those boats? How many of you have seen Christopher Newport's little armor that he wore? Not the smallest person in this room could get in it. And he was a grown man. How many of you went down and you had to do what? Duck, the 400 some years ago were people as tall as they are now. Have traits within the population of Homo sapiens changed over even before? By the way, 400 years in a geological time span is a blink of the eye. Is a blink of the eye. They have changed over time. The percentage of traits have changed over time. Are you with me on this? Why? Because the environment has changed. Was the nutrition the same at, for Christopher Newport as, as it is today? Was was any of that? The, were, were so many things changing? I, 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 I am, but said you were about to talk about the computer. I want you to. All right. So then, how can you really consider that evolution? Because we didn't really evolve. All our body did was just metabolize the proteins that were given to us. Okay. So we didn't evolve at all. Okay. So you're talking about your. Okay. So I love it. You're talking about evolving in a different way than the theory of evolution is saying. This is one of the this is one of the misconception. You're talking about evolving like you have made a conscious thing to evolve. The theory of evolution has nothing. Oh, it's not. Okay, so the environment 
pushes the, the advantage of certain traits within the population. And as the environment changes, certain traits are going to be more advantageous than other traits. And you're going to see those more in the next generation. So let's say this. Let's say this, ladies. And this is a silly thing, but maybe. Ladies, do you think our female ancestors looked for the same traits in their, their mates that we do? No. <laughs> I mean, I, don't, I want you to go back 10,000 years. And I want you to think about what traits, because by the way, except for in certain cultures, it's usually women who choose the mates. Now, some cultures have pushed that, that it's patriarchal. So, but, but it's usually women. And by the way, in a lot of species, it's usually females that choose. Think about the birds. Those little poor male birds are seeing themselves to death, right? Okay, so I want you to honestly take a second and think about this. You chose, our ancestors chose different traits. It would have been important that the person was fast, could throw a good spear, was, you know, whatever, right? And then if you get to make, guess what you get to, you get to have sex, guess what you get to do? You get to pass your traits to the next generation. And then the next generation, the percentage of traits that were found are going to be slightly different than the one before. Are you getting what I'm saying? So the theory of evolution simply states that the percentage of advantage, advantage traits within a population, depending on the environment at that given time, will be seen more in the next generation, will be changed in the next generation. Now, something might happen in the environment that makes that trait not so, advantage, so much of an advantage anymore. And then what would happen? Would they change again in the next generation? Yes. Let me give you something, and this has exhaustively been proven. It really has. Even if, what did I tell you you're mostly made of? Well, human cells are huge, but what are you mostly made of? Your microbes. Did I tell you all that? Your microorganisms. Those microbes that live in and on you are affected by your environment. When you take an antibiotic, can you take an antibiotic and you can take this as a pill? And you can say, look, I want you to just treat what's called in my urinary tract infection, and I don't want you to affect anything else, and don't affect any other things. So I'm thinking, well, and do you think it listened to you? No. <laughs> it didn't. And what it did was that medicine wiped out all the weak, let's say it was E. coli. It's E. coli is the most common cause. It's a bacterial cause of urinary tract infections in women. Let's say it wiped out, it doesn't wipe them all out. Guess which ones it wipes out? The weakest. And guess what happens to the E. coli that are still there? They still divide. And the ones that are dividing, now how many of them are resistant to whatever pill you took? All of them. Not all of them, but more of them. And did the percentage in their traits change in the next generation? They became more resistant. And then the next time you take it, again, you're building species of, of individuals in that species that are becoming more and more resistant to eventually what is going to happen when you take that medicine. It's not going to do anything. When you take a medicine to treat like a UTI, for example, you don't get rid of all the microbes. That would be, it, you would probably die if all your microbes were dead. You got rid of enough that your body can handle it and, and keep it under control and keep it under check. But the next time, because the percentage of traits for that resistant had changed in the population of E. coli, it's a different, it's a different ballgame. Do you get what I mean? This, is ha this happens over and over. There's, there's exhaustive research on this. Exhaustive. We can actually simulate it. And we do simulate it as far as like little species go. Now, whether we should be or not might be an ethical issue. But we do this. Percentage of traits found within a population change over time due to the environment changing. And here's what is not even a question. This is a, an environmental fact. What do we know about our environment? Does it ever stay the same? No. It has constantly changed from 4.6 uh, billion years ago. It has constantly been in flux and change up until today. And that environment pushes the living species, pushes them to have to for certain traits to be adapted. And those adaptive traits help you to survive. So an adaptive trait is helping you to survive. 
But just because you have an adaptive trait in this generation, in 10 generations from now, is that necessarily going to be an adaptive trait? Maybe not in that environment. Do you get what I'm saying? Do you get what I'm saying? Okay, but then wouldn't evolution just be a side effect of the environment is telling us? It's life. It's how life if, to be alive is one of those characteristics of life, and I'm not talking about just humans, because I know we think it's all about us, but it isn't. I'm talking about all life forms from the most complex animal all the way from fungi, plants, protozoa, bacteria. Life has the ability to respond to its environment. It's the number one trait of living things. If life could respond to its environment, it wouldn't exist. So a number one trait of life is that we can respond to our environment. Not all will survive the environmental changes. Not all do of the species. So again, the theory of evolution is not talking about individuals. It's not talking about beliefs. It's talking about facts that we see about the percentage of traits changing within population over time due to the environmental stresses. Does that make sense? There's nothing scary about that. There's nothing threatening about that. There's nothing. That is just things that we see. Those are sort of scientific things that we see repeatedly over and over and over again. Right? So that's what we see. That makes that a scientific theory, which we think of as differently from a social theory, right? Okay, so some of the other things that support the scientific theory are physical organs. Do you know that each of you sitting there right now have muscles that can raise your ears and turn them forward? Did you know that? But are they working? Are those muscles working? Now, why would we have them if they're not working? Because they worked once upon a time. <laughs> they did. But as the environment changed, we didn't need that type of, of extra help with hearing. For protection, so we don't have it. We have an appendix as an organ, that's a visceral organ. This does not work anymore. But in comparative species, it's part of the immune system. It it only makes sense that once upon a time it was working as part of our immune system as well, our lymphatic system. But it's not working now. Do you not? Everybody knows what goosebumps are, don't you? Does everybody know what goosebumps are? So when you have goosebumps, y'all know, that, or maybe you don't know, but every hair that you have, and most of our body is covered with hair, even if you have the kind of hair that you can't see, like my body hair. But I do have, you do have the microscope. Every hair has its own muscle. And every hair on your body, except for your palms and your soles and your feet, every hair has the ability to raise. Now, not all of those muscles are working. Not all of them are working, but once upon a time they did because they helped to keep us thermoregulated in environments that were really trickier, right? So, I mean, they did. So these, this is what's referred to as visible organs. And these are the ones that, um, that support the theory of what? That supports the theory that the percentage of traits of those working in a population did what over time? Change over time. That's exactly right. So there's just so many different things. Now we had already gone over this. Here's what I want you all to do. I want you all to change, change up what you're gonna do. This is a different set of notes, and here's what I need for you all to, uh, we need to start. This is lab one. Y'all ready for lab one? Oh, um, and by the way, lab quizzes and lab information are not on lectures, okay? They're not on lectures. So I'm going to give you some information starting a lab today, some notes, and some things I would like you to be able to do in lab, this, this lab one quiz, but this is separate from your lecture. Fair enough. Everybody gets that, right? Okay. So lot, guys, scientific measurements, measurements in science. You know, measurements in science, we need to be exact. And measurements in science, we have huge numbers. Uh, in units of huge numbers that we're talking about, like kilometers from one the planet to the sun, if you will. So this is a huge number, isn't it? We have hormones that have been detected in our body in minute numbers. It's tiny, like zero point. You know, zero, there's a hormone that was recently discovered uh, related to the hypothalamus that was that was discovered 
and something, I don't have to add, don't hold me to it, but something, something like this. It was something crazy. But is this even one, one milligram? No. Is it a 10? No. What is this space? 100 thousands, millions, right? So, but then we have other numbers in science when we're talking about science, because in science you need to be exact. Just like with drug dosage, if, you're, if you have one decimal place change in a drug dosage uh, thing, it could be a medicine that would kill your patient. So do we need to be, it's not all drugs like that, but do we need to be exact in science? Okay, so let's think about this. And so we had other numbers that we're talking about sometimes, like I said, like, um, I don't know, maybe kilometers from whatever. So if, do you ever give a number without a unit that you're talking about? No. So, it, yeah. But this is a really big number. And let's, let's say, I mean, some numbers actually go out like 43 zeros. How crazy is that? Right? And then how would you say that number? I mean, I don't know. It, it, it's big. It's really big. Right? But actually, there, there is a way that we can uh, say really small numbers or big numbers using scientific notation that makes it easy, right? And it makes it less, um, less room for error if we use scientific notation. I'm going to just really briefly let you know that scientific notation is not changing a number. It's just expressing a number in an easier way. We can even use scientific notation for numbers that we know that aren't even very big. What do you all know that this is? How many M&Ms is this? Remember, we have to get units. So, so this is a thousand M&Ms, right? Um, so how do we express that in scientific notation? One times three to the power of ten. Ten to the power of three. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so the way that we express this is we take the, the only real number here, which is one. We put a little imaginary decimal behind it, and we see how many spaces there were. And so this is ten to the third, right? So there's a way that you do this because we know. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, we know, and that these steps are always the same. Let me tell you what the steps are. They're always the same in scientific notation to get to this exponent. It's to look at your number, and when you, when you look at your number, at the first real number you get to, which is one, put an imaginary decimal behind it. Then you locate your real decimal on that number. And y'all know if a decimal's not given, that's a whole number, right? So you knew the real decimal would be here. And then you just count the spaces between, and that's the exponent to 10. Fair enough, right? So this is where this three came from. So let's say this, let's say we had something that was really tiny. Let's say as far as a cookie went, we only had this much of a cookie. Y'all have already told me that you know that this, if we had one cookie, that would be nice, right? But we didn't, and we didn't even have a tenth of a cookie, did we? What do we have? A hundredth of a cookie. Okay, could I express that in scientific notation? Sure. I could look for the first real number, which happens to be what? Read, you know, you read numbers left to right. So it's the what? One. And put an imaginary decimal behind it. Locate, and this time it was given, my real decimal. And how many spaces are between them? Two. two. So I know two is my x bar. Is that right? And I know now that my imaginary number is actually my imaginary decimal, my real decimal. But this isn't even one of something, so this is a negative. Are you with me? It's as easy as that. I don't care if the number is this big or this this little or this big. You would use those steps every time, just like that. That's called scientific notation. Is this number any different from this one? It's the same. Is this number any different from this one? It's the same. You with me? Just for fun's sake, are we having fun yet? Just for fun's sake, let's go ahead and do the scientific notation for this number. Just, just with me. I will give y'all practice one too. Y'all don't have to write this down because you're listening to people like that. So, so let's say, what did we say we have to do first is look at our number. We read left to right. Look, at the, the, look for the first real number. And this one, what's the first real number? Nine. Nine. And you told me you put an imaginary decimal behind it. Is that what you said? The first real number, put an imaginary decimal behind it. That's fine. 
And then you said the next step is to locate your real decimal. And this number was it given? Yeah. So it was given. It's right here. That was easy enough. Now we'll count the spaces between. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven becomes your what? Exponent. And the imaginary decimal becomes the real decimal, doesn't it? Am I finished yet? Because I look and this isn't this number isn't even a whole number. It's negative. Are you good? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so scientific notation. I've had students who have math phobias, and a lot of people, more than half the population have math anxiety. But I've had students say, well, does it matter if you start counting from here or here? And that's anxiety. No, it doesn't matter. Would it be the same if I'd started to count from the other side as this side? Yeah, so it's the same. So scientific notation. Let's go ahead and do this one. Let's do these, this longer thing. So where's the first real number? Eight. Eight. Put an imaginary decimal behind it. Oh, the color you're working. Okay. All right. And then what was my next step? Locate my real decimal. Is that right? That was right there. And what was the next step? Count. Count the spaces between. Is that right? So let's see. Be careful. You always are careful. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Did, did y'all check me on that? Yes. Thirteen. And then listen to this though. Any real numbers must be given. Eight point seven. So right. Thank you. Eight point seven. Now, is this number the exact same as that? Yeah. And you know where this exponent came from? Do you know where this exponent came from? Do you know where this one came from? Great. Those three steps are used to do scientific notation. I'm going to give you all a practice thing, a sheet with these, and we'll go over it on the next time we meet. And you get to just take it home and play. And you don't worry if you're having trouble with it. You just try to get with somebody that can help you though or something. Because the next time we meet, we'll go over these answers and see how you're doing. You're not going to have this quiz on scientific notation for at least another week. At least. Okay. But Understanding decimals, because you all all told me how many puppies do you have? How many puppies do you have? Uh, how much of a pie do you have? You knew that was half. 0. 0.5 is 5 tenths. That's half. Y'all knew that. If you know this, you know the metric system. How many of you feel good about the metric system? Good. I have some of you who feel really good about it. How many of you don't feel great about the metric system? All right. So some of you aren't. Kind of Okay, so, <laughs> so it's fine. All right, look, guys, I want to tell you something. If you knew those, what whole number and what those decimals are, you know them. And I want to let you know something. If I were to give you all a test on the American Standard uh, Measurement System right now, I'm going to bet, I would bet, I bet a thousand dollars, and I don't have it, but I, have a, I would bet a thousand dollars that not half of you pass it. Because you don't know your system. Americans don't know our measurement system. If I were to ask you how many tablespoons are in 0.75 gallons, would you be able to tell me? That's our system. With enough time, you'd be able to tell me. I could come up with questions you wouldn't know. I can promise you. Because in our system, nothing is exact. And everything that you have to do to, to convert it or to think of the numbers in a different way, like half of something or a quarter of something or whatever, you end up getting these crazy numbers with crazy remainders because our system is asinine and the whole world laughs at us about it. Did you know that? But America, pardon? Let them. We're America. We're supposed to be different. Yeah, whatever. Uh, you would hope we would be better. So, here, especially in 2019, in a lot of ways, we would hope we'd be better. Okay, so here's what I here's what I want you guys to know. In the metric system, which you already know because you know decimals, it's easy. It's so easy. You ready? You ready? Let me show you. I'm gonna give you three steps, and you could always convert the metric system. And you never change your numbers. Your you saw what I saw with real numbers. Real numbers never change in the metric system. 
The only thing that changes in the metric system is guess what? The decimal place. Now for this, and I want you to listen to me first, and then you can write all this down, okay? Because why you're listening sometimes people aren't. I mean, why you're writing sometimes people aren't listening. When we think about the metric system, again, I told you guys that you will never be given a number. Nobody's going to ever come up to you and say, Nancy, I'm going to say. Because you would say, what? You say, so much. I have 22. Don't ever write a number without the unit. The standard units you're talking about. So standard units, right? So in the metric system, for weights, we use a little G that stands for, what does anybody know? Grams. In the metric system, we use a little M that stands for distance, meaning meters, meters, right? And we use a little L for volume that stands for liters. So what are these, what are these initials referring to? Do you always have to be given the standard unit? Yes. Always. Now, I could be talking about kittens, but would, would that be a standard unit? No, yeah, it would. Would I get puppies? Seconds, seconds, hours, teardrops, would they be standard units? But by God, you've got to give them. You've got to give the standard unit. That has to always be given, right? But in the metric system, as far as weight, distance, and volume, that's always going to be the same. In our system, we're going to have teaspoons, we sometimes talk about, tablespoons that we're sometimes talking about, cups that we're sometimes talking about, pot, and I, just, just for volume. Oh, wait a minute, I forgot ounces. How many ounces are in a teaspoon? I'm, no, I'm noticing silence. Actually, I bet a thousand dollars that maybe none of you know. That maybe none of you would know that. So you don't. We don't know our system. Then we've got quarts. Then we've got gallons, don't we? And if I were to ask you what is 0.73 gallons, how many tablespoons are in it, you'd come up with some crazy remainder number. You want to give a drug like that? I promise you, you don't. Okay. So that's our system. How about distance for our system? We've got inches, and then somehow some royalties, however many inches in a foot, right? And then a yard, and then we have miles, right? How many feet are in a mile? 5,280. You would fail. All of you would fail. Our system it is idiotic. None of us know it. Instructors don't know it. I don't know it because I refuse to use it. It is idiotic. It is not exact. It is ridiculous. Please, let's throw it away and make people learn the metric system because it's easy and it's accurate and it can save lives if people are comfortable. I feel so sorry for pilots coming into U.S. airspace because they're having to go back from their easy system all of a sudden converting to our system. And I'm going to tell you something that the hardest part pilots have told me that, international flight pilots. That's why only some can fly international because others can't do it. It's crazy. So, okay, how about weight? We got ounces, we got pounds, we've got tons, you know, whatever. We've got, we've got things like that. But in the metric system, what do we have? Just these for weight, just this for distance, just this for volume. Are you good? All right, so, so get rid of some prejudices that you might have, get rid of some fears that you might have, and let's think about this, and I'm going to give you three steps that you can always convert to metric system. You wouldn't. If I were here, I'd have 10 of this, and then I'd have 100. If this is a you know, two space, it's one, two, one, two from the standard, one space, 10 kittens, one space, one from here. Or if I had a 1,000, grams, a thousand meters. And by the way, do these three steps change depending on if I'm talking about weight, meters, or liters? Not at all. Always the three steps. I don't care what you're measuring. Puppies, seconds, teardrops. There's a prefix. Now, this is not a standard unit. It is a prefix for a thousand grams, a thousand meters, a thousand liters. 
This prefix called kilo, and it's abbreviated with a K, has an exponent of three, because y'all told me that. Y'all told me that this could be written as that, didn't you? Did y'all tell me that? You said that it would be three spaces from whatever your standard unit was. Did you? You just did that, right? All right, so look, do I have just another minute? Y'all give me another minute. Then if we went 0 0.1, 0 point, y'all told me what this was. This is, you're, you have a tenth of a gram, a tenth of a meter, a tenth of a liter, right? Here you have a hundred if you went this far over. Here you have a thousand. There is a prefix, there is a prefix called centi that has this negative two, meaning two spaces to the right of the standard unit. I didn't make this up. I didn't make this up. That's scientific notation for that. Here is for milli, for milli, there is negative three. How many spaces are we to the, to the standard unit, whatever we're talking about? How many spaces? One, two, what? Three. We can keep going with, uh, with uh, 10,000, 100,000, a million. We can keep going, and this is actually called a micron, which is micron, and this is negative six. I know I've got to let you go. I'm going to. And this is a nano, which is negative nine. Just hold this in your thought process for a minute. For I mean, till next time we meet. And I will pick up here. But if you understand that I didn't make these up, this wasn't how much some king could drink or how big a foot was. This, these are exact decimal spaces from the where, from the where. Standard, if you understand that, I'm going to give you three steps, and you'll always be able to convert. Will your real numbers ever change? Yeah. Never. What will only be the difference? Moving the what? That's exactly right. All right. I'm going to see you guys um, Monday. <laughs>